So thank you so much for joining us. Today we have a Sandbox dedicated stream with Samuel Khan. He is the lead engineer for the Sandbox team and he graciously joined today to talk about their vision, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and maybe some of the things that you can expect in the future. So, hi Sam, tell Hello, us a Angela. bit more about yourself, please. Okay, so, well, I am Samuel, as <laughs> that's been said before. I now. am Sam. Um, I've been uh, doing these kind of uh, game engine editors for a while now. Uh, I've been working in different game projects within Ubisoft, and now I'm doing this here for Crytek. And I'm really be excited to be working on the CryEngine and to be able to show what we've been working on now for the past months um, since we released the CryEngine 5. So we've been really working hard on this new vision uh, mm -hmm. of the editor, this um, sort of foundations to build our new user experience. So I'm really excited to be uh, here talking to the community today cool. because you know we've been waiting for this for a long time. So you have mentioned before, uh, outside of the stream, you have mentioned that there are some core design pillars that mm -hmm. basically inspire you and motivate you to like how the sandbox should be. Mm -hmm. And these are intuitiveness, consistency, and powerful, fast iteration. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so as I said, we are really trying to redesign the user experience from the ground up and you know, to bring in modern user experience principles into this. And um, I think one of the really important things is intuitiveness. That means mm -hmm. that when I open the software, I need to be able to figure out how to do the things that I'm trying to do mm -hmm. without necessarily going and reading you know, technical documentation <laughs> yeah. or watching tutorials. These, these are all great, but it would be even better if you can just figure it out on your own. And I guess the thing that happens is that you have all of these softwares that you're using, and so you are sort of, you, you get into a certain thought process because a lot of the software um, that is out there follows certain design principles. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old CryEngine sandbox would have been something that was very similar to you know, previous versions of, of 3ds Max. If you had worked with 3ds Max a lot, um, you would be, it would be very easy to make the jump to Sandbox, which, which was a very okay. good thing at the time. And today we're seeing that people are using many different tools, and you know, that's also an axis we're developing so that the Sandbox is more open. It's not necessarily tied to 3ds Max anymore, and that's kind of the same thing that we're doing with the user experience. And yeah, one of the last focus uh, for us was really fast iteration. I want, um, you know, every time you iterate on something, you're making it better. And I think that's really the key to making quality uh, in a game or in, in whatever project you're developing with this. And so if you have slow iteration times, you may be inclined to do less of that because it's a more frustrating process. It's a longer process. Mm -hmm. And if you want to polish something, um, it, may be, it may be, you know, not practical to do it because I know that for CryEngine 5, we are advertising the sandbox as customizable. Can you tell us a bit more about customization and how, you know, it, not everything should derive from the standards as much? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is also a part of the same thing. I mean, at first, it, it should be intuitive to get into the software the way it's designed with all the defaults. Mm -hmm. But of course, as you become a better user and you know more familiar you're with more it. familiar and you you want to do different things in a different way mm -hmm. you need to be able to fine tune all of these things to your own personal workflow and that's uh, that goes down to each and every single person using mm -hmm. this thing and it goes at different levels i think the the first level would be all the layouts where you put your windows mm -hmm. we've tried to make this a lot more modular um, you can already notice this in this current version of the sandbox that it's a lot more modular and it has, it has some pros and some cons. Um, if you look at the uh, previous version of the Sandbox, we had the roll-up bar, which concentrated a lot of the functionality there. Mm -hmm. uh, and people got used to that, and there are a lot of good things about it. But we found that it was better for the future to break out all of these different modules and functionalities and roles that were encapsulated in the roll-up bar, uh, because all of these things you can now reuse to build different layouts for different types of workflows. You can clearly see also our new direction. We're trying to separate uh, two different notions here. We have the viewport in the center, but we're trying to separate the notion of creating things from the left side. We have the create object, where this is where you're going to um, explore the different things you can put in your level. And this is how you place things in your level. And we have the level explorer, which describes the scene, mm -hmm. describes the level. So on the left side, we have creating things. And on the right side, we have editing things. So once you have placed things, you can select an object, and you can see properties of that object, right? And actually, this is how I work on my machine, at least. I put all of my editing tools on the right side, and most of the editing tools are optimized for this 
vertical layout. Okay. So this is this is kind of the direction we're taking, and uh, we really wanted to experiment with this um, layout with two panels instead of one. Even though it reduces a bit the viewport, um, it it makes it enables us to have a clearer interface with less switching from tab to tab, and and we can make the controls a little bit bigger, a little bit clearer uh, to people that maybe are not so used to the to the engine. So you can obviously customize the toolbars. So. As demonstrated here, if you right-click on the toolbars, you can then uh, open this editor here, and you can create your own toolbars. You can add commands to this, and you can even, um, they save out to a file, right? So I can send you my file with okay. my toolbar, and you can get my toolbar. So if I make a toolbar for, I don't know, cinematic designers that is very custom to my, to my game, mm -hmm. then I, I make it once, and then I just publish well, that. Well, you just add whatever you need. So. Yeah, and you only need to do it once. Uh, that's the nice thing with all of these layouts and toolbars is that they are shareable. Shortcuts. So we have we have changed a few shortcuts uh, in this release, and maybe we'll get into that later. But at least you can find your favorite shortcuts into um, into the keyboard shortcuts editor there, and you can bring it back to whatever you like. Right? Exactly. So again, if you're if you're more familiar with a certain software, you can even make the sandbox feel like it's your favorite software. <laughs> so I really want to I really want to be friendly to people of any background there and, and try to make it possible for them to work in the best way. Okay. Cool. I like flexibility. Oh. More flexible, more modular, uh, and really focusing on a more modern user experience. And this this is really just the first iteration we're shipping, so mm -hmm. um, we're really excited to see now. Now that this is out there, now that we've taken care of the hard part, we're really excited to see what we can build on top of this. We are actually uh, boiling everything down to a command system, essentially. Okay. So every time you click to a button, it's calling a command. You could go to the console and type the same command, and that would work. And the, the nice uh, thing about this is that now we can expose these commands to different interfaces, such as Python scripting, right? Okay. You have a lot of people that are uh, doing Python scripting in uh, various content creation tools like Maya or Max, mm -hmm. and these guys they love they love to add extra tools over their um, yeah their main software. So we want them to do the same thing in the sandbox. So what can we expect in the future? So what will we be able to do next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, I mean, in the future, it's it's uh, kind of a mixed strategy I want to have. I don't want to focus only on bringing uh, great advanced features. I want to focus on really polishing our user experience to the point where we will be really satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very perfectionist, so it, it will take a lot of work there. Um, I want to iron out some some problems that we have. You know, there's always some bugs. There's always things mm -hmm. like this, and I want to make sure we're always on top of this, um, that we're as stable and as polished as we can, uh, but then we, we always have a lot of great features planned. And I think, um, I mean, if, if, I, if I look at the community feedback that I've read so far, and even internal sort of discussions, I think that um, a lot of the push will have to be on the asset workflow and the way we are course, you know, importing and dealing with assets and, and how that integrates with the sandbox. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the th exciting things that I, I, I'm going to be pushing are going to be related to that. Um, I mean, one of the big community requested features was the FBX importer, and exactly. that's something that you're going to continue improving. Exactly. So we, we uh, have actually a uh, first iteration of the FBX importer. Um, so we can demonstrate this, actually. We have this little rubber ducky in Blender now. And I, I know that Blender support has been a big community yes. feature. <laughs> um, so we made this quick demo uh, for this stream specifically. Um, so we're going to show you that you can now export a rubber ducky from Blender to a FBX file. And so, as I mentioned, with CryEngine 5, we now have the FBX importer. So you can import geometry there. And uh, I think that's a very exciting feature. That's, that's really showing that we are um, listening to the community and that we're going to be adding more in the future. So. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit also about some of the old tools that we'll be converting? Uh, yes, we'll be, we'll be essentially looking at a full conversion. Um, okay. So any tool uh, that is in the sandbox currently, uh, still an old tool, will uh, 
um, will be converted at some point in time. <laughs> um, okay. You know, but of course we have to take that with certain priorities because right now things are working for the most part and certain tools are being less used or certain tools are being phased out in favor of other things. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously if, if there is a big plan to replace a certain system, uh, we're not going to focus on, on you know, upgrading the tool quite yet. So this is exactly why I focused on the major tools that, that we have such as the terrain or vegetation or level editing. These, these guys are always going to stay here. Why did we, with the release of TriEngine 5, why did we release uh, engine source code, but we have not released editor source code yet? And I know mm -hmm. this is something that you personally wanted to address to the community. Of course, of course. I mean, uh, this is really part of the, uh, the business model was to release source code, and we have released uh, engine source code. I think um, one of the main reasons why the editor source code currently is not available is because we are, we are undergoing such a major transition. Mm -hmm. and. We are considering releasing the editor source code, but at the same time, if you would start really working with this today, it would be um, very difficult for you because we are making so many changes that you would constantly need to adapt and change the things that you do. So let's say you would develop an editor feature for your game, but that editor feature may stop working very fast because we're, we're still transitioning um, and a lot of the things are really uh, user-facing now, so we, we have the user experience or the beginnings of the user experience mm -hmm. that we want. But on the code side, a lot of things are changing. What's the current plan for the asset pipeline? Is FBX still the way to go? And what will happen to the cryo exporters? Right, OK. So I mean, it really depends where you are right now, I would say. Okay. If you're in the middle of uh, developing your game and you're already using the cryo exporter and that works out for you, then there is not really any reason to switch uh, if that supports if all the features are supported for you, then you know uh, there's not really any reason to switch to FBX. The reason why FBX could be useful would be if you want to use something that doesn't have a cry exporter, okay. such as Blender, as we mentioned before, and 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 that's supported. So currently, we will still support both, and I uh, I don't see any point in time where the exporters would be removed unless we can support the same set of features in another ways. Any plans for in-engine vertex painting or? A node shader editor. Okay, so those are two very, very ambitious features. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that I've, I've heard and I've been in discussions about this. So um, we're definitely aware of these things being a possibility. Um, what I would say at this point in time is that we are really focusing on um, improving our user experience and, and really creating solid foundations for the sandbox. Once these things are established, we can really be pushing the limits. Uh, but I don't think this should be a uh, concern of today. Or okay. I, I really think we want to focus on, on pushing the sandbox to a level where it, it's complete, it's fully transitioned to the new user experience, and we have a very solid asset pipeline. And then, you know, I really want to add very powerful features like this. So um, this, this will be ongoing, ongoing discussions, I'm sure. Okay, cool. And I have another question from Dr. Nochi. Uh, they would like to know if it's possible to create a level without terrain or ocean in the beginning. Here in the height map resolution, you can just select nothing. And this will disable the terrain, yes. All right, and now that's it. You can create a space level. I think you also have to disable ocean. Disable ocean, yeah. yeah. Ta-da! Yes, you can, Dr. Nochi. Are you going to support 4K displays in the future? Uh, the short answer is yes, yes, we are looking at uh, supporting high resolution displays. It's a bit tricky, it's a bit of work to do that, but um, we are definitely looking at it. Okay, so what's the current plan for UI and video textures, given scale form is a bit problematic? Yeah, okay, so uh, this is a bit of a more complex thing because uh, in-game UI is a very, very large topic. Um, and currently, the uh, scale form support that we have is a bit in danger considering scale form has been discontinued or isn't really actively supported. So I think we're going to be looking at solutions there, but I can't really go into details. So a uh, question from the community. Any plans on updating terrain textures workflow? Uh, yes, in general, that, that's kind of what I wanted to mention with the strategy. The terrain uh, editor that we have right now is a slight improvement, but is also essentially a one-to-one -one conversion mm -hmm. from the old one. And that by no means mean, means we are uh, 
done with it. So we will do another pass on terrain workflow in general, including these issues, including a lot of other issues we've identified. And you know, we will deliver another iteration on that. And then we'll get feedback again. And if necessary, we'll make another iteration on this. Okay. So this is really what I wanted to stress out, that none of these things are locked. I know that um, it's been a long time since many of these tools were updated. But uh, this is really the clear message that we would like to send is that we are really trying to uh, have active development on the sandbox and every tool and every aspect of the sandbox will be covered. And thank you so much, Sam, for yeah. joining us. This was like super awesome. Oh, thank you, Angela. <laughs> this was great. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more streams and, and to also checking the, the forum threads and, and see if there is more questions maybe on the, on the forum thread. I can answer them. So. And also thanks, Alex, for manning the computers while we were talking. Exactly. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We hope to see you in a couple of weeks for our next development stream. Goodbye. <laughs> Achieved with CryEngine.